Hello. In 2022, war returned to Europe. Russia invaded Ukraine on the 24th of February, and that action has had a profound and lasting effect on the world. The Russian attack forced millions of people from their homes and caused a global food and energy crisis and will continue to impact millions around the world for years to come. Now, over the past 10 months, Sky's defence and security analyst, Professor Michael Clark, has been giving us his insights to how the war has played out. I'm Kamali Melbourne and in the next 30 minutes Michael will be giving us his expert opinion on the key elements of the war in Ukraine and on what could come next. But before we begin let's take a look at the key moments of the war so far. The shelling is very close. The wreckage of Russian vehicles is littering this street. Here we go. It started before dawn. Can you hear that, Mark? It's the only way out of Irpin, and this would test even the fit and healthy. But those still fleeing are the most vulnerable. They are going west to safety. He will now head east to fight. There is going to be one almighty crush as people try to get on. Rats going up behind you now. Whatever fell from the sky made a crater this big. Yeah, Alex sorry. Crawford from Sky News. Close the sky and stop bombing. Don't, don't speak about the bureaucratic steps. You can see what's left of the missile here. The words on the side of that, Zadeti, it means four children. This is what it's like in Kharkiv every day. At first, um, we were scared, really scared. But now, we are ready to fight. Fight like hell. Precious monuments are now shrouded in sandbags. So through here, they're making the Molotov cocktails. Vladimir Putin thought that Russian forces would capture Kyiv within days. They failed. Instead, his forces are bogged down in a war that they're unwilling to leave and so far incapable of winning. They're very grateful to see something that they didn't think they would see for perhaps a long time, if ever at all. Well, the war began on the 24th of February. Its lead-up was months, if not years, in the making. Before we begin, Michael, let's just understand Ukraine in Europe and where it finds itself. Yes, it's the biggest land area in Europe, apart from Russia itself, so it's the biggest country, 44 million people, so again, it's quite large and it's potentially very rich, not so rich these days, but it is potentially very rich, and it has the, the great uh, Dnieper River running through it, and that divides the country into a sort of an eastern third, which is more industrial and more Russian-influenced uh, in its history, and a western two-thirds, which is much more agricultural and more influenced by Poland and Lithuania in history. So it's an interesting country and a major country in Europe uh, as and when it catches up with West European economies. Yeah, and tell us about the man prosecuting this war, the man who decided to invade President uh, Vladimir Putin. When the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, he was in Dresden as the KGB chief in a small town. He was a appalled by what he saw. He thought it was a catastrophe that the Soviet Union had broken up. And it was Ukraine that effectively broke up the Soviet Union. It was their demands for independence that created the momentum that broke up the rest. He never forgave them for that, never accepted that Ukraine could be an independent country, had his own view of Russian history. There was a crisis in 2014 when Ukraine began to lean much too far, he thought, to uh, the uh, European Union. And out of that crisis, they occupied Crimea mm -hmm. uh, by force. They occupied parts of the Donbass, about a third of it, with these separatist territories. And that gave him uh, the beginnings of a war. In 2022, for a range of other reasons, he thought the moment was right. And this common land border, 2,000 kilometres, then becomes very important because the Russians sent, for the third time, a series of, of exercises into Belarus and into uh, Western Russia. And these exercises, they said, oh, it's just an exercise. And the West was saying, well, these don't look just like exercise. It looks as if you plan to do something. No, no, just an exercise. The troops themselves thought they were only on exercise, so they didn't really prepare properly. They sold a lot of their equipment. They didn't get themselves ready. Only three people around Putin, 72 hours before the invasion, knew what he intended. Even Gerasimov, the chief of the general staff, he didn't know until three days before. And then on the 24th of February, suddenly these exercises became an invasion. They crossed the 2,000-kilometre border, and for Kiev, 
There's no way of defending yourself against that. No, but, and with all that build-up, how did Kiev defend itself? How did they prepare themselves in those... Well, those few um, years? militarily, they tried to defend themselves by going back to basics after 2014, that crisis, and they began to build a Western-style army based on Western principles. Um, but the political class, they just pretended it wasn't happening. They really didn't want to hear this. So they listened to those people who said, no, no, this is just an exercise. They wanted to believe the Russians. And effectively, they just ran out of rope. And it was 24 hours before the invasion before Kiev really understood what was about to happen. They, it was so awful, they just couldn't believe it would really take place. So as the war broke out, Michael, let's examine where we are six days into the fighting. What was the situation? Yeah, after six days, all these red areas represented parts where the Russians were making progress. And they were clearly making progress in the south because they were coming from Crimea, where their lines of communication were much shorter and their forces were better. So they were doing as they would have expected to do here. And around these other areas, they were making progress. And we all expected these to turn into arrows of quite big advances. And when people were discussing what are the Russians going to do, we thought what they will probably do is try to take all of the land east of the Dnieper River. That would be logical. They, they would then say, this is ours, and then, then start a discussion about what would happen to the rest of Ukraine, try and make it into, a, effectively, a, a, an unviable state. That seemed to be logical. We thought that this was getting, getting off to a slightly slow start, but we fully expected this whole area east of the Dnieper mm. to turn red within a matter of weeks. Right, let's focus in now on the capital, because, of course, to take the country, they would have wanted to take Kiev. And there was a key battle held just outside the Ukrainian capital in and around Hostomel Airport. Hostomel Airport. That was really critical. The Russians put their paratroopers into Hostomel Airport in the early hours. The job was get into Hostomel, go to Kiev, get hold of the government, kill Zelensky and anybody else around him, and then get more troops into Hostomel to take control of the capital. Once you're in control of the capital, 72 hours is what they expected, we'll then suppress any problems we have in Sumy and Chernihiv within a few weeks. The Russians felt that by about the 8th or 10th of March, it would all be over. And that was the idea. Their failure to take Hostomel, or to hold it, they took it, and then the Ukrainians got it back within hours. Mm. That failure cost them the, the rapid strategy that might otherwise have worked. And, and how many airborne troops did they manage to land at Hostomel? Uh, well, it was a couple of battalions worth originally, and then they were going to flood troops into the place with, with air power and helicopters and so on. Once you've got an airfield, you can do all sorts of things with it. You can get thousands and thousands of troops and equipment in. But the fact that they didn't hold it meant that they were having to operate from long distances, and critically, Kiev just didn't give in. Mm. Um, and the fact was, a lot of um, saboteurs in Kiev, a lot of Spetsnaz people who were designed actually to create trouble. There was an awful lot of rough justice, a lot of, of firing at night in the streets. We don't, still don't know the story of all of that. I think it will emerge that a lot of people were killed out of hand as the Ukrainians actually suppressed these sabotage squads that were in place already. And these early days, Michael, people will remember that this was the moment where we saw that traffic jam on the way down into Kiev coming out for the uh, prepared marshes. Tell us about that and how uh, significant that was. At yes, point. quite quickly, this big column started to... came across the prepared marshes and it was coming southwards. And we all thought, OK, this is the, the encirclement of Kiev. This will come south and encircle Kiev. Uh, forces from Sumy, who were making quite good progress, they'll encircle from the, uh, from the east and Kiev will be completely encircled, and then we'll see what happens. Will the Russians dare to bombard it, this great city founded in 482? Would they really bombard a city that ancient, much older than Moscow, or will they just squeeze it? We didn't know. The fact is, they didn't get close to surrounding it because the convoy stopped of its own volition, ran out of fuel, ran out of ammunition. Its tyres were all shredded because they were cheap Chinese tyres, Chinese and the Ukrainians attacked it in all the right ways. They attacked its logistics, they attacked all the things that, that they needed. And so the convoy eventually simply had to withdraw. It was a huge embarrassment. The Russians tried to pretend it was all intended, but, of course, it wasn't. It was a defeat. And this was only six days in. What were experts like you thinking when you saw that the Spetnats landed at Hostomel, this convoy hadn't moved? What did experts think about the way Russia was prosecuting this war? Yeah, we thought they were making hard work of it, but they would not fail because a country like Russia doesn't fail in these sorts of things. They actually, they'll, they'll do it roughly, but they will do it. We couldn't believe that they'd make such a hash of it for so long. We're now in the 10th month of the invasion, of course, but, Michael, let's go back to the first full calendar month of the war, the 31st of March. Describe for us the situation at that point. Yeah, Kamali, by then, it had turned into a sort of war of the cities, 
The, the original strategy, take Kiev within 72 hours and finish it, that had failed. And so now the Russians seem to be occupying or the area around cities. They weren't able to get into them, couldn't get into Kharkiv, couldn't get it. They did get into Kherson, but other cities they weren't able to get into. And so they stood outside of them. Kherson was the only city that they took, mainly because it was sort of given to them by collaborators in effect. And that was the only important city that they had. And in a sense, this was almost like four separate campaigns, four different areas, all run by local commanders. Nobody was in overall control. We were watching this and thinking, we can't really see the strategy behind this. This was just activity almost for its own sake. Didn't seem to be going anywhere. That's on the Russian side, no overall strategy. But let's move to the summer and the Ukrainian counteroffensive, because there was some definite strategy behind this and some pre-planning. Yes, um, by the summer, the Russians had taken Sverodonetsk after 100 days of, of, uh, of attack, and then they quite quickly took Lishishansk. This was actually the only good bit of manoeuvre warfare they conducted. They got behind Ukrainian defenders of Lishishansk. They had a good defensive position, the Ukrainians. They had to give it up or they were going to get surrounded, so they moved back. And we all thought, OK, the next battle is the final battle for the Donbass, which is Slovyansk and Kramatorsk. Slovyansk, very important symbolically, that's where the 2014 revolt started by the Luhansk People's Republic. And Kramatorsk is the centre for road and rail, particularly railways. If the Russians took that, then they get the rest of the Donbass. And the Ukrainians had made a fortress of both of those places. So we thought, right, that's the next battle. But actually, the Russians didn't get any further than Lishishansk. This was the high watermark of their advance in the Donbass. Yeah, the Ukrainians were able to punch through in that uh, part of the east, uh, while at the same time they were also focusing in on trying to retake Kherson. They were. They talked about retaking Kherson quite a lot, uh, and we all thought, OK, well, it's a neat trick if you can do it, see how long it takes you. But while they were talking about that, they persuaded the Russians, mainly Putin, to transfer troops from the Donbass down to Kherson, and then the Ukrainians hit them in the Donbass, and they retook Izium. Izium had been a very important centre for the Ukrainians, uh, the Russians had taken it, were basing their forces from Izium. Uh, the Ukrainians took it back and they pushed them right back until they were fighting then on the edge, effectively, of Severodonetsk by the end of the year. Uh, and that offensive has been extraordinarily effective. Uh, and, Michael, by this point, as we can see on the map here, Mariupol on the Sea of Azov is in Russian hands, and that was a long and grinding battle for that yes. city. It Baltic. became the sort of symbol of the war, the David and Goliath war. I was always saying at the beginning, I thought Mariupol would fall within hours. It should have done, because it was right on the, on the edge of the battle area, but it didn't. And I don't know how they kept on fighting at Mariupol, but they did. Mainly the Marines and the Azov uh, Regiment and a couple of other um, units... And the Russians became obsessed with the Azov-style steelworks. The Ukrainians disappeared into the steelworks, which uh, had lots of underground bunkers built by the Soviets in case of nuclear attack. There's no way they could be winkled out of there. And instead of just screening Mariupol and then moving on, which is where the, the Russians needed to send their forces north, they became almost obsessed with it. Mm. And so it became a symbol of the war. And the, although Mariupol was eventually taken by the Russians, the survivors of Mariupol are now the sort of Ukrainian heroes of this war, and they will be for a couple of generations. All right, let's move on now from the summer and to uh, autumn going into winter. And this is the moment where Ukraine were able to retake that city of Kherson uh, on the 12th of November. Yes, um, the Ukrainians had, had launched these large attacks around Snehirivka, but about 60 kilometres wide. Very ambitious, and we thought, mm, will they re really be able to get through there? But what they were reflecting was the fact that um, the Russians had failed to take Mikhailov earlier in the war, and by failing to take Mikhailov, and therefore they couldn't get on to Odessa further west, that meant that all of these troops who were west of the Dnieper were not doing any good. What were they there for, other than to occupy more or less empty ground? And the Russian generals wanted to withdraw them. Putin said no, at least twice that we're aware of. Eventually, the Ukrainians put, their, uh, put them under enough pressure, particularly at Novokovka, and then in Kherson itself, and the Russians withdrew. And the fact is, they, you know, Kherson, they, the Ukrainians didn't have to fight for Kherson, and the Russians therefore pretend that it wasn't really a defeat. Mm. But it was a tremendous defeat, because it was the only city of any importance that they had. They withdrew, and now the Ukrainians have got all of the area west of the Dnieper River. Uh, and... By this point in the war, Michael, the Russians have a new general in charge on the ground, a General Sorovikin. Yeah, Sorovikin. Uh, he actually has imposed some coherence on Russian strategy. He said, we withdraw troops from areas where they're not doing any good, we only fight the battles we want to fight, and we will pressurise the public in Ukraine. He said, he said, I'm not going to fight a guerrilla war against NATO fanatics. He said, we have technical means, that was his phrase, technical means of making Ukraine surrender, by which, which means... they mean... 
making the life as miserable as possible for the civilian population. So the gloves are off. It's clear this is a war to subjugate Ukraine, the country, 44 million people, to Russia's will. Sorovikin is responsible for the honesty of that policy. Uh, and, Michael, what have we seen in terms of the way that he's trying to, to fight the war? Because he told us the way he fought war when he was bombing cities in Syria. He's a man who just does what he thinks it takes. I mean, he's famous for bombing hospital facilities first as a way of creating more civilian misery. He's, he just thinks in terms of Russian soldiers. OK, Michael, for now, thank you very much for that. Now, coming up after the break, Michael and I will be discussing the ever-present threat of nuclear weapons being used. And we'll also look ahead to what may come next in the war in 2023. Hello and welcome back to this Sky News special on the war in Ukraine with Professor Michael Clark. Now, one of President Putin's stated grievances before the war began was Western military encroachment on Russia. Now, as the war's gone on, there's been greater and increasing NATO involvement. We've got the map of Europe up here, Michael, and we can see the NATO countries marked out in blue. And you can see they come right up to the Russian border. Yes, I mean, the NATO countries are marked in blue and in dark blue are uh, Finland and Sweden, who um, are not quite members yet, but almost certainly will become members pretty soon. And what this represents is Putin's worst nightmare, because NATO has enlarged itself since 1949 nine times. Never it's tried to enlarge itself, it's always responding to demands. Everybody wants to join NATO. And six of those nine enlargements has been while Putin has been in the Kremlin. So what he's seen is the old, the old Europe that he was aware of when he was a KGB chief in Dresden had a, 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 an iron curtain that ran across there. That was the border that he had to worry about. Now the border is around here, and that's a 1,000 miles nearer to Moscow. That really worries him because he only sees security in territorial terms. And he also sees the, the sheer strength of Europe. I mean, even leaving aside the United States and Canada, Europe has a population three and a half times bigger than Russia's. It has a GDP 12 times bigger than Russia's. And yet, because Russia is ruled by an angry, victimised autocrat who is very aggressive, we all have to be very careful how we handle him. And talk to us more broadly about the global response, because there has been global condemnation of the attack, but not from everyone. No, exactly. I mean, the United Nations met very soon after the invasion, and 141 states condemned Russia roundly in the, in the General Assembly. But 40 states uh, didn't, and those states included 35, 36 who abstained, and five who voted... Uh, in favour of, the, uh, of the, the Russian invasion. And those, those who didn't vote to condemn represent more than half of the world's population. So, essentially, half the world's population are standing back to see what happens, and half the world's population are outraged by what has happened. Uh, and talk to us about the support that NATO and the West have provided to Ukraine through uh, financing and, of course, through military means. Yes, I mean, the... the um... West has, has given Ukraine a lot of technical help, a lot of uh, finance, about uh, between five and nine billion dollars a month just to keep going, and a lot of weapons. Ultimately, the, the West is determined that Ukraine must not lose this war. The West isn't, isn't clear what will happen next, where this is leading us, but where it mustn't lead us, in the view of Western capitals, is to the defeat of Ukraine, to this naked aggression. Easy to say, that's harder to do when Putin tries to put pressure, particularly on Europe, to go, to go hard on Ukraine to uh, enter into some sort of negotiation. Yeah, and part of that pressure comes from the threat of nuclear weapons. Ten months of a war with a nuclear-armed power, that threat will always be there. But it's not just nuclear weapons that's the danger in this particular conflict. No. I mean, Putin has always talked about nuclear weapons. At the very beginning of the war, he talked about nuclear dangers. He's the only one who did. Nobody else talked about nuclear dangers. The Americans wound down their normal nuclear drills so as not to be provocative. The Russians increased all of their nuclear drills so that they were basically rattling their nuclear weapons at everybody else. Nobody takes him that seriously, to be honest. And the, and the, the Chinese and the Indians are very worried about his nuclear rhetoric. However... The nuclear threat that really does arise is the possibility of a nuclear accident at Chernobyl or Zaporizhia or any of the other three or four nuclear plants that the Ukrainians run, because although the reactors are all powered down for safety reasons, they depend upon electricity to remain safe, and if they're cut off by the bombing from uh, constant electricity, then the danger of an accident is always ever-present, and that's the real nuclear danger, that there might be another Chernobyl. So, Michael, talk to us about the ways this war could come to an end. 
Well, there are three possible scenarios. One is that Russia wins, which is to say that the offensive in the spring is successful, they win back a fair bit of territory, and the Western powers are sufficiently upset by the whole disruption that the war has caused to lean on Kiev to go into some sort of negotiation. So Putin walks away with some gains from the invasion. The second scenario is the Ukraine wins, which is the opposite of all of that, that the Ukrainians managed to push the Russians out of most or all of the territory they've taken since February, and maybe some more, whether or not that includes Crimea, and Putin pays a price for that failure, and then Ukraine wins. The third scenario, which I have to say is probably the most likely, is that this is a generational struggle. This will go on for a couple of generations, which means 20 or 30 more years. Remember, the Balkans is in an explosive state. That's 30-year-old conflict, still ongoing, in effect. So 30 years is not long for a conflict to take place, but the fighting will be on, off, on, off over a long period. I suspect that that's what we're going into. Well, on that then, at, at this point in the war, at this vantage point, can we see what the lasting impact of this conflict will be? Well, the lasting impact is that it proves yet again that a war anywhere is a problem everywhere in the world. Because this Ukraine war has created a food crisis, it's contributed to currency crises, it's contributed to trade crises, it has um, uh, regional implications in the Baltic Sea, uh, in the Mediterranean, in other parts of Europe. Uh, this war can't be contained. Even though the fighting is all in relatively small parts of Ukraine, the war itself is a big event. And one of the things that has impressed the Chinese is how they've not been able to stand back from this. They are affected by the war, their economy is affected by it, and their prospects are affected by it. And they have seen the West be much more cohesive than they expected. And if the Chinese are thinking of something similar in Taiwan, they are certainly thinking twice as to whether they could take Taiwan militarily if the West can continue to be as cohesive as it has been during this uh, period of the war. Uh, well, the final thought there is that on the West, can it continue to be as cohesive as it is? Well, this winter is a tough time. Uh, this is when it all gets more difficult because we've got to get through this winter, uh, get through all of the shortages and the high prices for energy and come out through the other side. But next year, if the West can remain cohesive, if it can remain united in its opposition and its determination to make sure that the Ukrainians prevail in this conflict, uh, then things will get a lot better because the balance of, of advantages turns against the Russians from the spring next year if the Ukrainians can hold the big offensive which we know the Russians are preparing for the spring. Professor Michael Clark, always appreciate your analysis. Thank you very much for being with us. Now, for more on this, you can, of course, go to our website or to the Sky News app. And for the very latest coverage on the war in Ukraine, do stay with us here on Sky News.